the anti-dihydroxylation of an alkene adds two hydroxyl groups across the pi bond in an anti-fashion. This transformation proceeds via the epoxide. If you'd like to refresh your memory on ways to make epoxides, you may find it helpful to view the video on epoxidation of alkenes. But as a very brief review, there are two complementary ways to convert an alkene into an epoxide. In one method, a halohydrin is first formed by treating the alkene with bromine or chlorine in aqueous media. Then, treatment with base results in deprotonation and intramolecular SN2 reaction to form the epoxide. Alternatively, an alkene may be converted directly to an epoxide upon treatment with a peroxy acid. Regardless of how it is formed, the epoxide is then opened in aqueous acid or aqueous base to complete the anti-dihydroxylation. Acidic epoxide opening begins with protonation of the epoxide oxygen. This yields an oxonium ion, which is then attacked by water acting as a nucleophile, which breaks open one of the carbon-oxygen bonds of the epoxide. Notice that water will attack opposite the breaking CO bond, and that's why this will be an anti dihydroxylation. The oxonium ion formed from this attack then simply loses a proton to provide the anti vicinal diol product. In basic epoxide opening, hydroxide attacks one of the two epoxide carbons, again opposite the breaking carbon-oxygen bond. In this instance, there is an alkoxide intermediate, which is protonated by water to yield the anti-vicinal diol product. Again, it is the initial attack opposite the breaking CO bond, which lends the anti-stereochemistry. In this specific example, the epoxide oxygen is first protonated under the acidic conditions used. The oxonium ion that results from this protonation has enhanced electrophilicity at the adjacent carbons. As a result, water attacks one of these two carbons, breaking open a carbon-oxygen bond of the original epoxide. The oxonium ion that is formed from this attack then loses a proton to the medium to give the vicinal diol product. Note that since the reactant was symmetrical, it did not matter which epoxide carbon was attacked by water. Attack at either center would ultimately have yielded the same reaction product. It's also important to notice that in this specific example, no stereocenters were formed so wedges and dashes are not necessarily needed when drawing the product. In other words, this representation of the product is the same as this representation of the product. If we subject the same symmetrical epoxide reactant to basic opening, the result will be the same. Hydroxide first attacks one of the two carbons of the epoxide, breaking open a carbon-oxygen bond. This results in an alkoxide intermediate, which is protonated by water, to yield the vicinal diol. Again, given the reactant symmetry, the attack of hydroxide could have occurred at either epoxide carbon and would have yielded the same product in either case. In this reaction, an unsymmetrical epoxide substrate is used, so we will have to think more carefully about the regiochemistry of the reaction. The process begins with the protonation of the epoxide oxygen. The oxonium ion that is formed 
will be attacked by water at one of the two carbons adjacent to the positive oxygen. The question is which one? In this instance we are dealing with a weak nucleophile, water. This weak nucleophile will be drawn to the center that bears the greater partial positive charge and that is the more highly substituted carbon which in this case happens to be tertiary. So a tack of water at this tertiary center breaks open this particular carbon-oxygen bond. The resulting oxonium ion sheds a proton to the medium, yielding a vicinal diol product. When the same unsymmetrical epoxide is treated with aqueous base rather than aqueous acid, the regiochemistry of the attack differs. In this instance, we are dealing with a strong nucleophile, hydroxide. And as this strong nucleophile approaches the substrate, it finds it easier to attack at the less hindered center. That's the less highly substituted center, which in this instance happens to be primary. So hydroxide attacks this primary carbon of the epoxide, breaking open the red carbon-oxygen bond. That affords an alkoxide intermediate, which removes a proton from water to generate the vicinal diol product. In the previous examples, no stereocenters were formed during the course of the reaction. However, it's important to note that epoxide opening may sometimes yield one or two stereocenters in the product. Let's first consider examples in which the product contains a single stereocenter. In this instance, an epoxide substrate bearing a single stereocenter is subjected to aqueous acid. The reaction begins with the protonation of the epoxide oxygen. The oxonium ion thus formed is attacked by water at the center bearing the greater partial positive charge. That is the more highly substituted center, which happens to be tertiary in this instance. Notice that this attack takes place at a carbon that is not a stereocenter. As the carbon-oxygen bond, drawn in blue, is broken open, there is no change whatsoever to the single stereocenter in the reactant. The oxonium ion that is formed loses a proton to the medium, and the product contains a single stereocenter with the same configuration as was found in the reactant. However, if that exact same epoxide substrate is subjected to basic conditions, the stereochemical outcome differs. In this instance, the strong nucleophile hydroxide attacks the epoxide at its less hindered carbon, and that is the less highly substituted carbon, which in this instance happens to be secondary. That breaks open the red carbon-oxygen bond of the epoxide. And notice that this time the attack is happening at the substrate's stereocenter. So the configuration is inverted at that center. The alkoxide intermediate removes a proton from water, and this affords the vicinal diol product. However, notice that this vicinal diol is the enantiomer of the one formed in the previous example. Now let's turn our attention to some examples in which the reactant and the product contain two stereocenters. In the acidic opening of this epoxide, the reaction again begins with the expected protonation of the epoxide oxygen. The oxonium ion is attacked at its more highly substituted center 
which bears the greater partial positive charge that more efficiently draws in the weak nucleophile. This breaks open the blue carbon-oxygen bond, yielding an oxonium ion that loses a proton to form a vicinal diol product. Notice the anti-stereochemistry of the two hydroxyl groups, which stems from the fact that when water attacked the oxonium ion, it did so opposite the leaving group. That's what established the anti-stereochemistry. If that same substrate is subjected to basic opening instead of acidic opening, the stereochemical outcome will differ. In this instance, hydroxide, being a strong nucleophile, attacks the less highly substituted epoxide carbon because it is that center which is less sterically hindered. This breaks open the red carbon-oxygen bond, affording an alkoxide that removes a proton from water to generate the vicinal diol reaction product. Notice, though, that this time it was a different stereocenter of the reactant that was inverted by the nucleophile's attack. And therefore, this vicinal diol is the enantiomer of the anti-vicinal diol produced in the last example. Both reactions gave anti-stereochemistry, but they afforded the opposite enantiomers. It is always important to be on the lookout for internal symmetry, but it is especially important to do so in reactions where the same group is added to each carbon of a pi bond. To highlight this point, let's consider the anti-dihydroxylation of trans-2-butene. If this alkene substrate is treated with a peroxy acid, two enantiomeric epoxides are formed. These epoxides may be opened in aqueous base. Since both carbons of the epoxide have the same level of substitution, in other words, they are both secondary, attack of hydroxide may occur at either center. So let's consider attack at one particular center on both epoxide enantiomers. When hydroxide attacks the first epoxide, it attacks from underneath. When hydroxide attacks the second epoxide, it attacks from above. And this yields two enantiomeric alkoxides. But when these alkoxides are protonated by water, they converge on a single vicinal diol product. It turns out that this molecule is a meso compound, meaning that it has internal symmetry and therefore has no enantiomer. The internal symmetry of this compound is not obvious until you rotate around the central carbon-carbon bond. Upon doing so, the internal symmetry plane becomes quite clear because the molecule is now in a more highly symmetrical conformation. Since this molecule possesses internal symmetry, it is identical to its mirror image. Rotating this identical mirror image around the central carbon-carbon bond produces a different conformation of the same molecule. At first glance, you may have thought this to be a second reaction product because it appears to be the enantiomer of the structure we drew originally. But now we can see that there is in fact only one reaction product due to the internal symmetry of the molecule. In summary, the anti-dihydroxylation of an alkene is accomplished through conversion to the epoxide 
followed by opening of the epoxide in aqueous acid or aqueous base. The regiochemistry of the nucleophilic attack depends on the conditions used. The hydroxyl groups in the vicinal diol product are anti to one another. And this reaction has no carbocation intermediates and so no rearrangement is observed. The preceding was an excerpt from the book Introductory Organic Reaction Mechanisms, a color-coded approach to arrow pushing. If you found this video to be helpful, you may be interested in the complete book, which is available in ebook format from Scribd, in paperback from Amazon, or in paperback at a discounted price from Lulu.